Hey, Levi, what's up? So 2020 is coming to an end. What are we here to talk about? Books, man. Books, yeah. So I know that's something you and I have always kind of shared as an interest. We always are kind of sharing book recommendations, things we've enjoyed learning about, different ideas and stuff like that. Um, 2020 was kind of a weird year where obviously we were all shut in, working from home. But it was a cool opportunity to reflect on some books, kind of learn some new things. Um, but, you know, I think it was also hard because we had a lot of other stuff going on. So we talked about it a little bit, wanted to come on here, talk a little bit about what we got out of this year from reading and some things that we're excited about moving on into the new year. So does that sound good to you? Yeah, sounds perfect. And just a little caveat here. I'm not like the craziest book person in the world. Recently just picked up like my first actual hard copy book, maybe two years ago or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, John, you're always someone that, you know, was always reading. So it was always a good person to get recommendations from. But uh, just if anyone that's listening to this isn't a reader, like it starts somewhere. It's been great. Like it's been one of those things where you always think like, oh, a successful person like reads and you don't really understand why. Even after like reading for a little bit now, I still can't really point my finger on, on anything super specific, but it's just been a super like enriching thing to add to my life. And I just it's been real, real good experience. For yeah, sure. well, it's a funny thing because like, you know, so for people who don't know, like we went to college together and so we took some classes together. There's this weird thing, I think, where when you're in the academic like funnel system, you're constantly getting things pushed to you to consume if that's like reading, if that's articles or whatever. But then you graduate and you kind of have this like open world that you go into, you know, it's like a video game. You get to pick your character and you have the you have the ability just to pick what you want to like consume, you know, if that's like you know, whatever it is, art, creative stuff, what have you, but then books suddenly become this new opportunity where previously they were assigned to you. Now you're almost designing your own curriculum. You're designing what it is you want to learn about and what you want to be curious about. And so that was something for me that really clicked, you know, a few years ago. And then I don't even know how we got started about it, but then, yeah, I was like sending you a book recommendation. Then you'd send me a picture you're reading at the pool and stuff. And I thought that was super cool. So. <laughs> yeah, it was <laughs> great. It just caught you at the right time. Yeah. <laughs> I think right when I started, it was uh, taking the subway to work. And I was like, you know, I, I did the whole like, listen to music, listen to podcasts. And eventually I was like, you know, I think it'd be fun to be one of those people that reads on the subway. Like just, yeah. the, uh, just the idea of it seemed fun. And then I started doing it. And I, I never really looked back. Yeah. Well, that's the funny thing, right? It's like, it becomes a habit, you know? So, I mean, that's perfect lead into, I'll start with uh, the first one I wanted to talk about, but the thing for me that I think really clicked with reading was starting to think about it a little bit more than just say, hey, here's a book. I need to read this book because I have to, you know, learn this stuff. I have to get this knowledge into my head or I got to have some kind of application for it in my real life. That's true. But I think taking a step higher than that, I started thinking about myself more as a reader, right? And so once you have that identity, once you have that in place for yourself and how you see yourself, then you start taking actions to fulfill that identity. And that becomes reading books. It becomes consuming podcasts, reading articles, thinking about what you're reading and taking notes. And so for me, that one started with Atomic Habits, the James Clear book. So I think I picked this one up like, I thought I'd read this one. I think I'd been reading this guy's newsletter for a long time. And so I finally got around to reading it um, this year. And it was super awesome, super helpful. I've since picked up his daily habits journal. And so I've been using that daily and trying to figure out the best ways for me to use that. But there's a lot of stuff in the book, but the main thing he talks about is what I just mentioned about identities. He basically says the best habits you're going to learn are ones that are congruent with some identity you've, identi you've, you've created for yourself and how you see yourself. So that's really cool because I think it's helpful if you're trying to like do something better for yourself. Like we're both physically active. It's because we see ourselves as athletes and we have this identity for ourselves. So we're going to eat well, exercise and do all that stuff. It sounds like what you just said, you know, a couple of years ago, you suddenly started reading a little bit more, but you then kind of created a little bit of an identity around that. Wouldn't you say? Yeah, right. Like it's you, you see the guy like playing music on their phone out loud. And it's like, well, that's definitely not the route, right? Like that's not a displaying a lot of characteristics of somebody that I would hold respect for. And mm -hmm. you kind of think about like, what is that type of person that you do hold respect for? Who are the people around? like you, for instance, or someone I look up to for sure. And it's like John reads, you know, like a lot of people in my life are like reading books or, you know, whatever the case is, just the general like public perception of like the average CEO burns through 30 books a year. Or, you know, those you hear those quotes and stats all the time. Right. And so I was like, okay, I've never, I've never tried this. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you said that book. I actually recently, I was going to be the next book I, I did on audio and uh, the audio of it was kind of terrible. So, and I haven't done a hard copy in a while. 
uh, mainly because I haven't been traveling. And like you mentioned yeah. before, like the pool is kind of like the two places I would hard copy read. Um, but now I think that that's definitely gonna be the next one I pick up. That's yeah, cool. I think it's it's kind of funny. Like you do more audiobooks than I do. I like physical books over Kindle or audio just because I'm a, like a note taker. So I don't know if I picked that up from, I think I picked that up from Ryan Holiday reading his stuff and how much he talks about writing in the margins. And so, I mean, like if I look at this thing, like, you know, I can go to sections and I've like highlighted a ton of stuff. I've like written in it because it's very much like a, it's an application book, you know, like you're not reading about Roman history. What are you exactly going to apply from that? Like it's more of that's just for fun reading. Um, but this kind of stuff, you know, I'm reading this because I don't want to then apply it in some way. So like that, I would definitely say is like a hardcover book to check out um, just because it gets into that. It's like, why am I doing this and what does it flow into and trying to just, you know, create more of an identity for yourself and being conscious about that. Because we all have identities for ourselves. I think the hard thing is a lot of people have it just scripted and they're not thinking about it, which is a crazy thing. Right? <laughs> like people just feel like I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm overweight or I'm not successful at work or I'm not good at relationships. And a lot of that becomes self-reinforcing yeah, yeah. with whatever you do in life, right? Like, oh, would a healthy person do this? Not like, should I do this? You know, does a, you know, person in healthy relationships take this action or not? That kind of stuff's all like super relevant. So that's my first one. What's, uh, what do you got? What's your first one? Uh, I'll go with probably most impactful. I like, uh, what is uh, in, the name of it? Indistractable. It's not, I don't know if it's a real word. That's why I stumbled there. Indistractable, uh, written by a guy named Nir Eyal. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, but basically he wrote a previous book called Hooked. And it was just about like, the, it was basically the, the Bible or the, the playbook for Silicon Valley to get people addicted to things, right? So like when the apps blow, are blowing up and there's just incredible competition for attention, it was the playbook for how do you garner the most attention? How do you get people to keep coming back? Um, they basically gamifying people's lies, but kind of in a negative way. And so after having written that and being a huge success, he kind of took a step back and was like, oh no, oh no, what did I do? And then so he kind of reverse engineered from that a book, oh. Indistractable which is basically the anecdote to um, how do you mitigate and, and kind of keep those uh, attention grabbers at bay and, and kind of focus on what actually you care about. And oh, that's uh, interesting. In, in, yeah. basically in, in short, yeah, it's great. Cause it's, it's, it's data driven. It's coming from a place of, again, like the world is against us right now. Like it doesn't even matter if news is real or not. Like all that matters is how long are you staring at the article? Right. Um, and it's just kind of peels back the curtain on, how those types of traps are built and how to best avoid them. Uh, yeah. And it, again, you mentioned the audio thing that the audio portion of things are important to me and the narration is, was solid as well. Yeah. Um, and I really well, so, that so it's uh, did you watch the social dilemma? That was a documentary that came out this year that was like pretty widely talked about. Have you checked that out yet? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So it sounds like very similar to that. It's like, you know, and this isn't sound, it doesn't sound like this is coming from some journalist who's just commenting on what they're seeing, but it's a guy who was on the other side of the table and he made all those systems. <laughs> and then now he's like, right. You got to fix this. This uh, went a little bit too far, a little bit too far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he gets pretty, uh, he gets pretty, I don't want to say ridiculous because maybe this is more practical than probably general public gives credit, like gives uh, credit for, but mm -hmm. to the point of like, you know, deleting, deleting all the apps off your phone so that like the only time you use an app, you're actually like, you know, on an iPhone for instance, like swiping down and searching it real quick, like searching Instagram. So you're not just pulling up your phone and Instagram's right in your face and then you hit it because it's right there and it's where your thumbs used to go in and et cetera, et cetera. Like all the muscle memory and uh, neural memory and all of that. Like how can you put as many blocks to just, uh, I don't know, like free flowing throughout your day without like really making it. Right? Well, yeah, and just making, making uh, it, you're just being more mindful and like your decisions more intentional and not just getting swept up in whatever's in front of your face because you, know, you can look around anywhere and there's a million different ways you could get preoccupied by something you know a dog or a cat or a kid or your phone bings or whatever it is like the world is here to take our attention away and mm -hmm. in order to actually get things done that are meaningful you know to you you really have to do as best you can to, to kind of put blinders on those types of things and so he gives very actionable steps whether it's you know turning off all notifications or you know all the different apps that are out there that can help you block things out um, and just a, a bunch of different stuff like that is is in the book, which is fun. And, and also, again, just seeing like the behind the scenes of like what it, why we're so addicted to things like the swiping down being akin to a, a slot machine. Right. So it's like yeah. if you're checking notifications on one of your favorite apps. That action is literally the same. Like, is it going to be a dopamine hit? 
Is it going to be like, it's just a, it's just real fun to, to kind of go in that level of detail. So I really yeah. enjoyed that book. I've, I've listened to it twice um, the past year. Oh, wow. You went through it a second time. That's awesome. I feel like that's always a good sign is like, is something going to hold up enough? Do you want to revisit it? Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, I, I <laughs> just burned through it. I like, it's funny, <laughs> funny that I was like addicted to it, but like, I just burned through it the first time. And I was like, there's no way I retained everything that I need to know um, from this book from going through it that quickly. Yeah. Uh, so that's like an interesting yeah. tangent that we could go down. Cause um, I know that was a conversation I've had with some coworkers after I watched the social network is all right, finish this learned a little bit from it. What are you going to apply from it? So after going through that, is there anything that you changed for yourself and how you're consuming media or did it reinforce anything you were already doing? Um, I, I put blockers on some things like I do not disturb hours on certain apps. I think it was just more so like a reminder as well to be more cognizant of how I'm spending my time. Um, and there's some mantras throughout the book that I, I have plastered on like wallpapers and, you know, uh, things like that. Um, really just, yeah, the mantras are there, like one of them being, and this is actually a, a theme in a couple of the books that I've had written down. Um, but like what you fear most is what you need to do the most because a lot of these apps are taking a lot of comfort and it's like really in order to grow, you need to be doing the things that are difficult and that you might not necessarily want to do that doesn't give you a good short-term dopamine release. And that's yeah. been a big, uh, a big point of emphasis for me this year, especially Having had, you know, pandemic, much like a lot of people, like I went from this person that I felt like was operating very highly and kind of ticking all the boxes and absolutely being the person I wanted to be to kind of slowly falling off that. And then my my kind of neural structure was a good balance of long term, short term dopamine. And all of a sudden, like the short term dopamine just started to creep up, creep, creep up, creep up. And all of a sudden I'm operating on like 100 percent short term dopamine release. Um, yeah. So that type of thing, for instance, you, you can't be reminded of enough of you know, where you're getting your, your pleasure and your happiness and how that's affecting your behavior. Um, yeah. Well, there's also some mindfulness about that, right? Like after, after all that stuff, like, so with the new iOS, I tracked my screen time. So I've got screen time limits on apps. So like if I, you know, my main two ones are mostly Twitter and then also Instagram. So if I go to open one, it gives me that, do you want to, like, you've only got, you know, do you want to just make this available for the next 15 minutes? So I'll do that. But then sometimes I will click on it and I'll say, you know what? okay, there's this extra hurdle. I don't really want to do this right now. It's kind of just, you mentioned, it's like mindlessly putting my hand in the cookie jar. I don't really need to do that, you know? And I'm trying to pay attention also to when I almost, you're trying to almost notice when you have those effects, right? It's kind of like if you had a glucometer on and you're noticing that having this cookie spike your blood glucose, it's kind of the same thing trying to think, okay, I just keep distracting myself with this one thing. Why is that? And then am I feeling that basically dopamine rush? And can I notice when that's happening and why it's happening with stuff? And it almost makes me think like, have you ever heard of the Eisenhower box? Are you familiar uh, with that? Not, not ringing a bell, no. So it's uh, it was this thing that I think I've seen in, I think it's seven habits of highly effective people. Cause I remember we, we've talked about it at work a bunch. And so it's basically just like a quadrant, right? And so you have on one scale, urgent. Not oh, yeah, yeah, okay. And you got like, yes. I think it's important and not important. And so a lot of the time mm -hmm. we just, we want to put out fires, but they're not really like house burning down fires, right? They're like unimportant kind of things. But I think you can almost rework that nowadays to that like short-term rush. Like, cause that's the thing. There's like that sugar, you know, there's like, okay, am I eating like this, you know, the brown rice or am I having the cookies? <laughs> a lot of times it's right. that. We just keep finding more and more ways to just reach for cookies. It's bad. Yeah. And, but the <laughs> best thing is, it's like, once you've hit that long-term box enough times, at some point, whether it's six months, 12 months, five years down the line, you'll start to see that like all of the long-term, you know, effort you put in starts to show its face almost every day, like we'll take physical fitness as an example, right? Mm -hmm. You're like working out, you know, working out, eating the right stuff and you're just heads down and you're just, you're putting in the work all of a sudden six months down or not even six months, if you do all the right things, really like two months to six months are going to be like drastic increases. If you're truly every day doing the right thing, um, you start to get long-term dopamine release every day, every day you get out of the shower and you look in the mirror and you're like, damn, this is cool. I'm proud of this. And then you're, you're doing some physical activity that your coworkers or something are doing as well. And they're all gassed and you're just like having fun, you know, or, so, you know, not getting injured, being able-bodied. Like every day that brings joy, like walking upstairs brings me joy every day. Cause I'm like, I know at some point in my life, like I won't get to do this. So yeah. like, that's just like another, it's just like a small, you know, investing anything like that. Right. Like the long-term benefits start being around you all the time.
you know, I'm sure like growing a happy, healthy family, same thing, right? You just wake up in the morning to your like eight-year-old son, like tie his shoes and you're just like, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> it's like that doesn't happen like in one day. You can't like overnight have, you know, work really hard and the next day have a beautiful family. Like that's a long-term uh, task. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing. So that's what James Clear talks about in his book. And then another one that I read this year by Gary Keller called The One Thing. They both talk about that, how there's this like geometric progression, this like exponential progression that we experience whenever we're doing a new activity or learning a new habit or whatever. And like, I've had that this year. I've been trying to play the piano and I get really frustrated when like, one, you know, the next day I'm not like infinitely better at this song I've been trying to play. And it's really frustrating trying to make this like incredibly you know, minimum, like minimum uh, progression from day to day. And I haven't stuck with it really well, but it's like stupid. Cause then I can think back and say, okay, like, you know, when I was 16 and I started, you know, training for sports, um, I felt like I was making a lot of progress then, but now like all of that has paid off over the years and I've noticed those huge results. Right. And so that's just like the hardest thing. And our brains just suck at that. Like we're so short-term yeah. oriented that this long-term, progression we just totally miss sight on totally miss sight on yeah which so. uh, that kind of works into one of my books i read i've reread a few times but the uh the war of art it's a real small mm -hmm. book so you can easily breeze through it just like as a reminder um and one of them being my favorite chapters is i don't remember the exact phrasing but like resistance is the true north which kind of goes into what i said before like what you fear most need most probably need to do yeah. I mean, that goes into it. Like your brain is not your friend. Like your brain is not on your side at all. Like it does not care about your goals. Your brain just wants to like reach this homeostasis that it can't actually reach. And that's mm -hmm. all. And it wants to expend the least amount of energy and it just wants to chill. Like that's what your brain's primary goal is. And like yeah. in the world we live in, this existence that we're in, like our happiness doesn't come from that. Like the more comfortable you get and the, you know, more chilling you do, like the sadder you get, like that's just kind of how we're wired. And so that's the one thing, when I, and I think we talked a little bit before we went live on this, is like, I, I battle a lot within myself of like, am I pushing too hard or am I like, am not pushing enough, basically? Like, do you need to chill out or like, do you need to double down and, and you know, say like cut out more carbs or like whatever it is, I'm, yeah. food I'm less, less crazy about these days. But like, you know, that's the, the kind of battle that I have. And it's, it's kind of comforting to remind myself that like, oh no, like resistance is the way. Like I think doubling down on the, on the effort is typically more often than not going to be the route. Yeah. Well, Ryan Holiday talks about that in uh, one of his books. It's one of my favorites, Obstacles of the Way. That's like his whole thing. Yep. Is like, if you're encountering resistance with something, like that's giving you a sign and it could take you in a couple of different directions. So one is like, if you've got that resistance there, it's because you need to grow in some way. Um, another one that he talks about that I think is interesting from a competitive standpoint is that if you're in some market and you're hitting this bottleneck, like we all want to think that we're special snowflakes. We're probably not. And there's probably a lot of other people hitting that bottleneck as well. And so if you think about it, if the entire market is all hitting this one bottleneck and no one is progressing through it, there's a ton of value in being that first one who gets through it and solves it because suddenly you're in this blue ocean, it's all yours. And there's like significant um, ramifications for business from that, I think. And, and I am dealing with that with certain things where we just see that in different parts of the market there's issues that are, you know, constantly coming up with groups. And we're always thinking about, okay, how could we be the ones who create this special mousetrap that can be a huge differentiator because we can go and say, all these other groups are dealing with the same problem. We've got a special solution designed exactly for that that no one else has. And so like that obstacles of the way is one of those ones. I don't think I read that this year, but I've probably read that at least three times. I'm probably going to revisit it next year too, because it's just got so many nuggets of things like that. So, okay, I'm what's, not, I what's can't get enough of that? Yeah. So, so what, what's up for you next? Um, I'll go with a uh, uh, green lights, Matthew McConaughey, recency, recency bias. Uh, again, the audio book, like it was just such a good time. And yeah. uh, kind of what I mentioned before about like, am I doing too much or not doing enough? Uh, one of the things that I'd like to incorporate in my life a little bit more is just a more pleasurable reading experience. Um, not necessarily like mining for the gold nuggets, like just kind of enjoying it and, and taking the story and, and learning whatever you can from it, but to not stress too hard about like maximizing the return on me reading or listening to a book. Right. And uh, 
Green Lights was just such a good time. Uh, it's structured really great. I, I did the audio version, so I had McConaughey speaking, which is just like, you gotta love that. Wish oh, that's every cool. audio yeah. book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, it was just great. There's, there's so many stories in his, in his life that are crazy. And again, like the resistance thing, there's a couple times in the book where he does some pretty outlandish things, like just for the sake of shaking it up. Like, no, I'm too comfortable, fuck that. I'm gonna, you know, one of them is like, he goes to the middle of Africa with like nothing, right? Yeah. Just like goes town to town or village to village. Like literally with not, it's just in, insane that a person that famous would go, just go off and do that. Um, but there's just a ton of stories like that. And then kind of one of my favorite themes throughout the book is he, uh, he calls them bumper stickers, you know, just like a one line motto that he'll just pepper into a story. So it'll, it'll either be like a preface to a anecdote or maybe it'll be in the anecdote he has a bumper sticker that'll pop up that kind of guide his next step or, you know, as a conclusion to, to kind of summarize whatever he was talking about, uh, he'll, he'll throw in a bumper sticker and it's just, mm -hmm. it's just a really good time. I learned a lot about him and it's always fun. Like I'm always an autobiography or biography type person as well. It's kind of like self-help or, you know, biography. Right. And I just, again, like the, these people that get to the mountain, the top of the mountaintop, it's like, it's never an accident and it's never just like on a silver platter. Like it's, the work is always there. Like the effort and the work and the, it's just, it's always reassuring again, like you said, like everyone hits these bottlenecks, but it's like the ones that are really on top are the ones that are just, no, like I'm just going to keep working. And if I flame out and die, putting in all this effort, then like that's, that is what it is. But like, there's no way I'm going to let it end on a what if. You know, yeah, it's not so. lucky break after lucky break after lucky break. I think that's like it's exactly. kind of inspiring. Right? It's like oh, I could, I could, I could do that. Then okay, this is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like when you're watching. Like for me, when I was younger, I'd like watch TV or something and see an actor. I'm like, why the hell is this guy? Like, well, you know, I'm not going to name a name, but like, how the hell is this guy getting another leading role? And it's right. like, well, because he auditioned five billion times and like got enough relationships with the right people, and then like eventually, you know, it's it's never just they casted a mediocre guy just for the sake of it because they right. felt you know yeah i don't know but yeah really <laughs> good you. experience i'm sure that the hard copy is great too but again i think um you're right about i think hard copies are the way to go because narration just is too much of a variable and how you receive information sometimes but, but it depends the on the person audio book like you mentioned so good. mcconaughey like mcconaughey is probably just like butter you know he's probably so smooth when he's reading his book i mean and it's his book yeah dude <laughs> the whistles and some of his words like it's just such a good time yeah so it's interesting what you said though about um like trying to think like you know you're asking that question about that actor i can't remember where i read that but something i think i read it this year i want to say it was in maybe an article or just in a newsletter but someone mentioned how when we see others who have something that we don't have but we want if that is something like a material or if it's like a status thing or it's a job or whatever it is a real natural ego preserving behavior for us to assume that they got some lucky breaks and that they didn't go through what we've been experiencing and that they just have a completely different experience of how they got there. Um, because the alternative is that we, if we think that they went through and succeeded in spite of the things that we have also struggled with, that's going to make us feel worse about ourselves, right? There's kind of this like ego thing going on there. So yeah, you're yeah. saying, oh, like, you know, there's ego no way. Preservation is the worst. Yeah. yeah you your know. brain is just not your friend. It's just really not. As much as it would be nice if it was on our team, it's just so yeah. not on our team. It's ridiculous. It's so bad. Yeah. Um, so the autobiography, though, so the one that I'll bring up next is uh, Bobby Hundreds. He wrote a book. This is not a t shirt. Mm. It's not a t shirt. It's a book. Um, it's really cool. So like I first got interested in the hundreds in like college, going to school here in LA, um, going to their stores and learning a little, little bit about their story and just yeah, following. Did, did you ever, uh, ever stay overnight in a car for a, like a warehouse <laughs> drop or anything like that? <laughs> yep. That was us, uh, overnight. What was that? Was that 2010? I want to say that was fun. Like the one thing I, one thing I remember from that the most is that was like when I was really introduced to Yellow Wolf. I think you oh, or, yeah. or someone like that was really into it. And like, it's the, every time I listened to any Yellow Wolf from then on out, like I always thought of that night. It's a great I spent, I spent like a solid 15 minutes this year revisiting Yellow Wolf. And I just kind of felt like it was kind of like when I look back at pictures of myself in really baggy jeans and stuff. And I'm like, oh yeah. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> There's a couple, there's a couple, I haven't listened in a while, but there's a couple of them that I remember like really, anytime I would show someone, oh, I can't think of the, anyways. Yeah. <laughs> it was a good time. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> but so the cool thing about the Bobby Hundreds book first, 
autobiography, like we mentioned, that's always fun. Um, I heard Jim Collins actually mention this on a podcast with Tim Ferriss like a few weeks ago. So he mentioned not having that their connection, one of their connections is that they both didn't have very present fathers in their lives. And so for me, that's not like exactly accurate in terms of how it came to be, but in effect, right? So my dad passed when I was like young, I was 10 years old. And so one issue I've always had to rec- rec- deal with is that I always looked at sports as a opportunity to replace that like male figure in my life. So I always was like a little bit too hung up on the, reaction I got from coaches. And so that was something I've had to deal with and, and, you know, look at and examine a little bit. And so Jim Collins mentioned that he has always read a lot of biographies, autobiographies, um, specifically of male figures, or the reason why, you know, he'll look at male figures, for example, is because it's trying to learn from men, right? And I think that's a relevant thing that we can all talk about. I think I've had good experiences and learned different things reading male or female authors. And so for him, reading male biographies was an attempt to recreate that father figure, learning male lessons in his life. And I thought that was kind of cool. You know, it's always lessons to learn from them to do and lessons to learn from them of what not to do, you know, and I could talk for like an hour about the Teddy Roosevelt biographies I've read about things not to do as well as the things to do. Right. Um, But Bobby's is really cool because he's not some old guy. Right. He's a young dude, Korean American kid from Riverside who started a clothing brand uh, the hundreds is huge and he's a really cool guy. And so it was cool to read his story, you know, growing up in the punk rock scene, getting into clothes with a buddy and just the entire entrepreneurial journey was really awesome. And I think the fun capstone to finishing that book, I then picked up a second one that's the signed version because I just had to. Um, I'm surfing up in Malibu, uh, you know, basically Topanga Canyon. And I'm coming in off the surf. Uh, this dude comes in around the same time. He almost hits me with his board. And I'm like, oh my God, what the hell, dude? And so I'm getting into my car. I'm putting the board on my car. That guy walks by. He gets into his car and he's got a hundreds license plate cover. And I'm like, oh shit, I think that's Bobby. And so I yell out, Bobby? And he turns around and it was, but and so I spent like, you know, five minutes probably chatting <laughs> with him. It was super cool. I told him, like, hey, I read the book. I got this signed version of it you know, I actually mentioned camping out. I was like, dude, when we were in college, we camped out for one of the overnight warehouse sales. And he was like super stoked on that. Um, it was just a super fun time. And uh, uh, I think he had just announced that like the fun, the fun thing that, you know, as part of his journey is again, he's this kid from Riverside who just really liked drawing as a kid and he got really good at it and he just kept doing it. He was announced like a week before I had seen him then. And I had brought it up. He was announced as one of the eight or 10 artists who's doing LA 2028 Olympics art. And so he was like, you know, he was considered one of these important people in the creative space to do art for the Olympics. And like, that's such a cool thing to go from that kid who's just drawing in class and his parents are pushing him to do school and he just doesn't give a crap about it. So now he's doing art for the Olympics. And it was just this really cool journey that I felt like is a cool capstone to the book that I just finished and read about from him. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it was super fun. It was like one of those cool things like, you know, I don't know. Everyone has like major celebrities. Like everyone wants to meet like, you know, a major athlete, but he's someone that a lot of people wouldn't recognize. So it was kind of a more in crowd kind of thing. And that's always an interesting dynamic. I've had that a few times with people where I recognize them and no one else is recognizing them. Um, It makes you feel more like you're in a special club. You know, it's funny. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. It's fantastic. Yeah. So um, last one I'll do is uh, I just finished this one up over Thanksgiving. And so it's funny. I've always known I need to get better at mindfulness. Meditation you know, always just was too, too robes, too much incense, too much all the stuff that was weird and I couldn't get behind, you know, just being a like, being a jock, you know, all that stuff, yeah. wearing, wearing a suit. I was like, I, I can't do this if I'm just humming and doing my ums and all that stuff. <laughs> And well, so yeah, and again, like from the, the competitive side of the sports and just kind of our similar upbringing, it's like, right. how do I max out the meditation? It's, like, it's not a yeah, quantifiable I'm like, thing. I gotta optimize so this. Like, yeah. Where's my optimization, yeah. you know? So I think I heard him on some podcast and I can't remember whose he was on. Maybe again, Tim, Tim Ferriss, as I listened to a lot of Tim Ferriss and uh, Dan Harris was on there and I didn't really remember this. It was a little bit before I was really paying attention to stuff, but he was an ABC anchor. Came on the air in 2000, I think four it was. I think Gail Sawyer threw it over to him. And this dude just had a panic attack on air. Freaked out, 
wasn't able to finish. He, I think he kind of stumbled through it. And it basically then coming out of that, he reflected on his own life, went through a bunch of different things, got sober because he was using drugs. And then he started doing a lot of work um, reporting in the spiritual space and then starting to practice some, uh, meditation himself. And so the whole book, 10% Happier, is all about saying, I don't know if I'm going to say that meditation is life-changing, but it can make your life 10% happier. And for a lot of us, I think that is a fair thing for me to read. And I like, I enjoyed that, that he wasn't making some like huge grandiose statement that my life was going to be irrevocably altered. You know, he's not going like, you know, again, yeah, not, not going to name names, but like the people who have these self-help books who say like, your life is going to be so different. He's very realistic. He's right. like 10%. A lot of people will take 10% in any area of their life. Get 10% happier by learning how to meditate. So that was something I've started doing this year. And there's a whole host of reasons I think it was important this year to start doing that. Um, do you do anything like that, like mindfulness or meditation? You know, not in a traditional sense, not like that. I know, uh, and again, like a lot of this is, you know, the, our phones and just all the tech in the world. I mean, working out in the mornings is like mm -hmm. kind of the only real replacement because like I take that very seriously. I'm not someone that's going to be like texting between sets. So I pretty much have a phone that's like playing music and it's got a running timer and that's about it. And so like, that's the closest I get to just letting my brain do its thing and be present. Um, again, not the same thing, right? Because the level of meditation that um, Dan talks about is a lot more, uh, a lot less going, you know, stationary. I mean, there's the walking meditation too, but like the, the stationary, like really just being in the moment. Again, like the indistractable, like it could just being within yourself and being there and present and just like nothing's the end of the world, you know, I don't know, just being present, I think is a huge thing we miss a lot, a lot in our lives. So yeah. I, I try to, again, like petting my cat or playing with my cat, that's kind of like a pseudo meditation, but again, not, not anything in like the real traditional sense. Yeah. But it's way, I mean, that's a good point you mentioned. That's, that's, I think what I almost miss the most about going to gyms regularly is that was my time. I could put headphones in and I'd play the same. I mean, I probably listen to like the same exact set of music every time oh. I, would, uh, I would just kind of go through <laughs> go through the motions but I not you're say, it in a meditative way you know <laughs> sorry i thought you were gonna say listen to the same there's been many a time where i'll listen to the same one song for like days on end i do that i do actually set my phone yeah like if i'm working out and i'm really liking the song i set it so it just repeats it i'll listen to the same song yeah. for 30 minutes while i work out <laughs> like it's, it's like mood right yeah. mood regulation if the bpms are the right level and it's like a, a decent message in the song again it's like a mood regulation thing where it's like oh i can just keep this but yeah i, I love message gymnastics are fun but yeah, yeah i really do miss it. i think that's a big important part about the gym too it's like going yeah it's i miss it a lot i'm, I'm getting around it running has been something i've been doing more recently again mm -hmm. um which again i'm like listening to books now when i'm running so it's like all kind of uh goes together but yeah uh, yeah but yeah so yeah i mean that was like that one i think i even shared that book with you like that was helpful for me. He just yep. talked about, you know, don't listen to, but pay attention to the voice in your head and what it's saying. Cause we have that ego that we talked about, that selfishness, that everything is about me. And it's like, you know, someone did not cut you off because they saw it was you. <laughs> like They cut you yeah. off because they're late for work or they're doing something like you are not a person to them. You're not some unique individual and a lot of stuff. It doesn't happen to us. It happens around us and it's going to be our decision how much it affects us, you know? And that's like, I think that's such a hard thing. I'm constantly like, I think one reason I'm pulled to it is because I'm so bad at it, right? <laughs> like, like I'm, I'm interested in this because I realize, oh my God, I suck at this. To me, like everything, I, I'm so high, you know, I'm like a normal person. Like I take a lot of things personally that I shouldn't. And so I, it's a helpful thing for me to read that, contemplate on that. And then now I'm using the call map. Um, for myself, they have a daily meditation. I'll do that 10 minutes in the morning, but right when I wake up before I walk the dog, just trying it, you know? And I think it's one of those things that's like, it's not going to be perfect again, like from day one, it's start doing it. And then as I do it, I'm going to start iterating. I'm going to figure out what works, what doesn't work. I'll leave out what doesn't work and I'll keep doing what works. And then eventually it'll get a lot better, right? It's just the key is starting on it. So I think that's like for me in 2021, I'm going to really focus on trying to do that every day and being more conscious of it and being constructive. So I'm making that as good as possible as a habit for myself. Yeah, for sure. And even like, not this could be a whole nother tangent that I won't get into, but just even like 
oxygenating your blood and getting rid of carbon dioxide in a purposeful way is like super beneficial as well. Like regardless of the mental aspect of it, just like the biology behind meditation too is just uh, super important. Yeah, uh, I but mean, I know me, anecdotally, like, being stressed like and sitting all day. Yeah, like, well, I'm anecdotally, I've always, I've always struggled breathing through my nose. I feel like when I'm pretty consistent about it, I can breathe through my nose really well because I'm just doing these slow, long breaths through my nose. And like, I've always taken allergy meds, all that stuff. I, I do wonder if doing the meditation helps as much, if not more than a lot of those things, you know? And it's, mm-hmm. I, I don't know, maybe. I mean, he, he references some studies. I'm not, I need to do a little bit more research on the actual uh, amount and quality of that research that goes into the effects of meditation on things. But it's working. If it's a placebo for me, I don't care. It's working. So I'll keep, you know, yeah. I'll keep well, and again, going back shit. to what you going back to what you first said about like the, you know, the character of the person you want to be like, what are the types of things they do? If meditation is one of those things, like regardless if meditation in a silo does anything for you, it helps complete the picture of that ultimate, you know, form of yourself that you're aspiring to, then of course it's beneficial. Yeah. Well, you could even take it a step back and say, okay, Maybe the person that I aspire to be is not a meditator, but they are someone who is calm, selfless. They're not thinking about everything having to do with themselves. Mm-hmm. Those are all open-minded enough to take on a new a new uh, behavior, like right. And so those are all traits that you could develop through meditation. You know, so it's like it's kind of that second taking a step back from that, I guess. So yeah. yeah. So so, so why have uh, this, do you have any on my list is. Why I have 10% happier, it's on my list of, I, it's hard to come up with five. I just said a few that I, I kind of jotted down. Um, but the one takeaway from 10% happier that you didn't touch on that I kind of really took to heart mm-hmm. was your life doesn't have to be in shambles. And like a problem doesn't, because you mentioned he does, he had drug use and some other things that he didn't love about himself. And he was spiraling, but like on the surface, like really doing super well. Like, you know, I'm sure anyone that was peripherally in his life was like, would always name, you know, it's the type of person that you wouldn't expect to be at like bottom by any stretch. Right. Um, but he took drastic measures to combat some things that in his life that he was doing that he didn't necessarily like about himself and not like in a, and I don't say don't like about himself, but like he just had things in his life that he wanted to cut out and he took aggressive action towards it. And that's something mm-hmm. with me again, like I kind of always battle with, um, am I being too hard on myself or am I, or should I relax more? Um, and I think part of that is like, oh, like this stuff isn't that bad. Like you're fine. Don't worry about it. Like for me, again, like with work and COVID and all this, like I was in a situation where I was brought into a new role and then the people, all everyone above me uh, left, whether it was termination or on their own means or whatever. And I was just faced with this huge workload, started taking Adderall, started taking sleeping pills every now and then, like smoking weed, like things that are not like objectively on a binary scale are zeros, like if you're going to classify them. And right. they just kind of stacked up and stacked up. But like on the surface, it's fine. Like I'm still collecting paychecks. So everything's going fine. Like I'm still better shape than most people. And you know, like there's no real one thing you could pick on to be like, dude, this is ruining your life. But like right. aggregate, it was. And I think one of those things with 10% happier is like, no, I don't have to reach an incredible bottom in order to like be aggressive and fight at it like it is a bottom. Because like it's all relative. And, you know, who's to say bottom really exists? And so that book, I, I kind of caught on an upswing of my positive behaviors and it just kind of solidified like, oh, like you can double down on this. Like there's, there's no reason to hold back against being the person you want to be like in, mm-hmm. in any stretch. Yeah. Like there's not some threshold that something has to get to for you to say, okay, now I can make that change. Right. Like I always go back to, yeah. uh, is one of my favorite music artists and he's got some line, like a junkie won't bounce until they hit the ground. And like, that's always in my head <laughs> thinking like, okay, do I need to wait until I'm hitting the absolute bottom here? Cause like, I've gone through that before and that sucks. So like, why would I want to experience that again? Why don't I just make that change now? Get off in a little bit of a different direction and do the thing I need to do, you know? Like I do the thing I need to do that's going to make me, you know, become the person I see of myself and all that. So that's right. why. But again, why it was like the aggressiveness <laughs> of the response is what I liked. Like but in like football terms, like if you're a fullback on an ISO, like, yeah, you can seal the linebacker and it's the same as pancaking the shit out of him. Like the running back still just going to run past. Like the the outcome of the play isn't any different, but like, why not pancake him? There's no reason not to pancake him. So like, that's kind of what I took from it among the things that you spoke to. Got it. For sure. That's cool. So do you have anything else? Uh, I am interested to hear what you're planning to do for the new year. And if there's anything, uh, 
Uh, yeah, New Year's time. I don't have anything on my, my reading list is kind of in like the self healthy finance area right now. So like, I'm not super excited about any one thing, although Atomic Habits was one of them that um, is on my list. I will touch on one more book. It's kind of cliche, I guess, but I, I feel like a lot of people are aware of it generally. And just, uh, I just can't shut up about it to most people, or at least the, the concepts in it, which is uh, The Magic Art of Tidying Up by Marie Kondo. Mm, um, yeah. Not so much about like cleaning out your closet and like organizing your space and all of that. Like those things are important for sure. Um, but kind of the two things from the book that I really, really took to heart was um, number one, like just clutter in general, it, besides it, it works as like your brain creating barriers to what you're really trying to do. Right. So like everyone's been in a situation where like you have a paper due or you have something for work or whatever the case is. And like, before you start on that, you like organize everything and you do a bunch of cleaning beforehand. So like by having things cluttered, it like pretty much puts a prereq to you starting anything of importance because you got to do like the cleaning first is what your brain is telling you. And so like part of the book is like if everything's orderly, then there's nothing left to do but the important things. Um, so that's number one. And then number two is like, does this bring me joy? Does this bring me joy? Kind of that concept of like with each of the items. And it's not really about like the reason to, to get rid of things is because once everything else is gone, then there's nothing, again, like there's nothing left, but the things that bring you the most value and make you happiest. So like for me right now, one of the things that I don't do enough, but I wish I would do is like use my fun camera equipment and like make videos that are higher quality and like maybe sit down and like write out sketches instead of just pulling up my camera phone and like blurting out some random stuff into the camera and posting it. You know, I'd like to be more thoughtful about the way that I go about, about producing video content mm -hmm. and Part of that is like, well, if everything's clean, like, you know, if you want to shoot something, it's like, well, no, I got to clean up because I don't want that in the shot and all of, you know, it's just, it's all very tangible and real and they're real barriers. And I think just, and again, on my phone, like I've recently, you mentioned Yellow Wolf before, it's kind of funny. Uh, I, I used to download songs, right? Like if I only liked one song from somebody, um, we'll say the Chainsmokers or something. Maybe I just like their one Chainsmoker song. I would like make sure and download like two or three other songs so that if anyone ever like looked at my phone, they wouldn't like be able to tell that I just like the one song. Like a, a very like <laughs> insecure high schooler type behavior, right? Yeah. And the other day I was like, why, the, why do I like, I have songs I love. And it's like, every time one of these songs comes up on shuffle, it's robbing me from a song that I like absolutely love. Like why would I settle for a six or a seven on a loving a song when I could be hitting tens every single time? Like I have a thousand ten songs on there, but all these yeah. other songs that are in my shuffle are just like diluting the magnitude of the joy that I get from these songs. Um, and it just, it just comes up everywhere. I had that so with that's, Spotify. That's one of them. <laughs> I had so many yeah, albums I had in my liked songs. And it's like, I like that one song from Coco. Always gets me. Remember me is great. I don't need the 30 other songs yeah. from Coco getting into my playlist, you know? And so, yeah, I, I did the same thing. Yeah, or... Or the songs that like you only like under certain conditions, right? Like a, we'll say uh, like a Lil John song, right? Like I don't need a ski, ski, like I don't need that in my library. Like I don't want to listen if I'm at a party or if I'm have friends over and we're like we want to be in that mood. Like I can go and search that song and play it. Like I don't need it to live in my library. You know what I mean? And it's just like going back to the intention and mindful. They're all kind of they're all related, and it's just I don't need to just stash my yeah with things that I kind of like. It's like I, I only want the things that I really love. Yeah. Um, so that's one because I know a lot of people like did the Netflix show and people kind of get the gist of like oh yeah Marie Kondo like does it spark joy and it's kind of like a meme uh, but the book I think is really really important I think for me especially um, but I think really for anybody and going back to Ind Indistractable and all these other books like like get the BS out of here and like it's, so you can focus on what matters it's really it's just I can't hear it enough and I can't hear it in it in it in enough you know different ways really hmm. um so that's one before wrapping up, I want to touch on another one that I was out of my comfort zone was Brene Brown, Daring Greatly, um, kind of the opposite of a lot of the stuff that I've listened to or, or read in hers. Is, it's basically just like, it's OK. Like at the end of the day, like it's OK. Like everyone's going through some shit. Like you don't got to be perfect all the time, but it's not in like a the way it's presented, the information is presented is in, in like a don't still try hard kind of way. It's just it's just like a hey, relax. Like it's OK to just be. You know, don't worry about everything. Like you're doing great, like, it's just, which is something that like everyone needs to hear. You know, at some frequency uh, yeah. throughout the year, throughout the whatever. Like it's not a it's not a huge deal. Yeah. Um, and then the last one I'll do real quick is the Power of Broke by Damon John, uh, the sh the shark guy, the Fubu guy. Um, 
part of that is we, we like to tell ourselves we need a lot of things like, oh, if I just had this, then I could that. And this book is just a case study after case study of just like um, ways people got around not having any money and like being even more effective than if they would have had money because of just the mindset behind the approach on certain things. Like yeah. quick example would be FUBU, um, billboards cost X amount of dollars. But like, instead of doing that, we can like pay local artists to tag up, you know, storefront, I don't know what you call them, but like the drop down kind of, I don't know what you would even call it. Uh, I don't know. The, the storefronts when they close at night, you know, in like urban areas, they have the, yeah. the little drop down thing. It's just like tagging those up. It's like, yeah, it's not the same as a billboard, but like it's borderline free. And like your target demo is more likely to see that than like a, a billboard on the highway. Cause like they might not have car, you know, just everything aligns better when you are forced to think more creatively. And I think in this world, it's really, really easy to create fake barriers for things um, mm -hmm. of why not to start something. Um, which like TikTok is like a big part of my life currently. And like, that's really fun because there's very few barriers on TikTok. It really is just like pulling your phone out and, and taking a very raw video. Yeah. Um, and that's just like made a bunch of like really young kids, millionaires, like overnight, basically. And it's just like a testament to like, you don't need this stuff. Like you don't need to start a YouTube channel. You don't need an expensive camera. You don't need a this, you don't need a that. Um, it's helpful sometimes to like, to boost yourself, but you definitely, I think people take for granted the, uh, the advantages you have when you're forced to think a little bit more creatively about things yeah that makes sense but i mean i think that's like a nice like kind of tie into the james clear stuff with atomic habits and yeah i mentioned tim ferris the thing i was going through just like earlier this week because i've got some time off i was revisiting some of his like lifestyle design kind of planning and how it starts with a, you know saying you might be thinking about the stuff you want to have as you spend more and more time thinking about where you want to be in the future, you're going to think more and more about the stuff you're doing and the person you are less on the material things that you have. And, you know, that goes back into that identity. You know, people may think like, Oh, I want to be the successful person who's driving some cool car and has got the mansion and all that. But like, to me, all that stuff means, you know, doing the things I need to do to take care of the people I care about and being able to host and, you know, entertain people. We don't have to have like a mansion to do that. Uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's what does that actually mean for you? And, uh, you know, like the Marie Kondo stuff even gets to that. It's like this philosophy on keeping what matters, discarding the rest, keeping things simple, letting you just focus on what makes you happy. So, yeah, I, that's the cool thing I think about this. I, we both, I think, are aligned on that. It's a fun way to get into people's heads who we admire. And it's just the Marie Kondo thing. It's like, okay. I'm not going to like necessarily take everything from this book and apply it to my life, but there's going to be some nuggets. Let me capture those, move on to the others. Maybe I'll go back and revisit it. Um, but there's always, you know, good stuff in there that I can take and apply to my life. So uh, for the new year, um, is there anything particularly you mentioned, uh, anything else that you're looking at doing, or is it just kind of like keeping, keeping centered, keeping doing all the stuff you've been doing? Yeah. Uh, one of the things you kind of mentioned, like, I want, to, I, I want to take video production more seriously. That's like one thing I've really been trying to focus on. Although again, in my own head, it's like, are you creating more barriers just for the sake of creating more barriers? Or like, is the outcome, the value of like putting in that extra work and maybe putting out less content um, going to be more beneficial in the future because then now you're more comfortable with a higher end product in that process. Yeah. And I'm leaning more towards this side of like, I think the value there, especially on a platform like TikTok where like it is largely just camera phones. And I've seen time and time again, now it's starting to creep in more where people are coming in with mirrorless cameras or DSLRs and mm. their content, it just stands out a lot more. And, and the watch time is a big algorithm metric there. And so if you can get someone to sit there and watch for the first two or three seconds and then and get them to actually watch your video, like having a clear, crisp picture is something that's only gonna help you in that regard. Um, and that's just, it, it's something I picked up over the past year, like TikTok kind of blew up and I started like early November, October of 2019. And so I just like, I'm decently positioned. So I feel like if I'm not really going to put, you know, the effort behind it, it just, it doesn't make a lot of it, a lot of sense. So that's one thing. Um, and in order to, to accomplish that, I'm not, I'm going to have to eliminate all of the distractions. Right. So it kind of goes back to what we were speaking about before about being more intentional because I'm not right. just going to budget more time i have to like really it's the focus it's the focus more so than the effort for me personally because i'm good at effort um but the sustained yeah. focus is that it's been my biggest barrier i'm somebody who who gets tired of something after a, a 
three months, six months and moves on. Like it's my stick to itiveness could muscle could definitely be improved. And so I think that's something I, I, I would really like to, to focus on for this year. Yeah. Cause you don't have an infinite amount of time. You got to leverage your time. So find those things that you're really good at lean into that, you know, margin it, like do everything you can to ma- and maximize it. That's key. So I think that's a good spot to leave it. Um, my phone just died. So I think there, my camera just died. So I think my camera is telling me it's time to call it. Uh, but <laughs> this is cool, dude. We'll, uh, we'll have to do this again and kind of recap on what we're reading and other stuff that we're learning about. Cause I always enjoy sharing ideas with you. Appreciate your viewpoints and thanks for your time today. Yeah, for sure. We definitely need to grab your dog and go up into these snow-capped mountains uh, while it's out there, for sure. I was out there today. Just the clarity is just unreal today, man. Yeah. Um, and I haven't been up in the mountains in probably a year or so. So uh, we'll have to do that. Cool. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Levi. Appreciate it. All right. Yeah. Great talking to you. Yeah. Bye. Bye.